Good evening or good morning, wherever, whatever part of the world that you're joining us from. My name is Karen Abraham. I'm the Vice Dean at the Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. And I'm so happy to welcome you to our webinar series that's called Digital Heaven or Hell, the future of our data-driven world. This is a question that is constantly in our minds. It's going to determine our future at every level. And it's already here and we're very much concerned in terms of our children and what it's doing for them, in terms of the benefits that it's giving us for medicine, for agriculture, for climate change, and for all of the issues that we're facing today and that will follow us in the future. I'm extremely fortunate to have two of my colleagues joining me today. And together we've actually been working to bring together and form a bridge between humanities and medicine. And so my two guests today are Dr. Galit Wellner and Professor Noam Shamron. But before I start with introductions, I just wanna let you know that when you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. And after the two presentations that we'll hear today, I'm gonna to go through some of those questions. We'll get them answered from our, uh, from our uh, guests. And I'll also have some questions that I'm very curious about which I'll ask both Dr. Wellner and Professor Shamron. So again, welcome to this event. Very happy to have you here and for us to start talking about the datafied self, health and happiness in the digital age. So first, let me introduce our first guest, Professor Noam Shamron, who I've been working with for many years, wonderful colleague. And Noam is passionate about using basic science to advance better health care. He heads the functional genomic team at the Faculty of Medicine, a very large team of incredible graduate students, staff, research scientists, and postdoctoral fellows. He joined Tel Aviv University after training at MIT, and he now leads a very large, as I said, multidisciplinary team of scientists, and they're working to develop computational methods for parsing big data in the biomedical field. They also work on experimental data, and they're trying to understand diseases at a very deep level. Professor Shimron is also the director of Durasi Institute of Oncology. He's the editor of a book that I highly recommend for those of you who are interested in reading it called Deep Sequencing Data Analysis. He's director of the Rare Genomics Israel. He's academic director of Science Abroad. And he's co-founder and chief scientific officer of Variantix, which provides clinical interpretation of whole genome sequences. And what I can say about Noam is since he's joined Tel Aviv University, he continues to be at the absolute forefront of genomic medicine and helping us really understand what's happening on the level of several diseases, which you'll talk about in the next minutes and understanding them in the deepest level using both machine learning and artificial intelligence. So Noam, welcome, really glad to have you here. And please tell us about your work. Thank you for the introduction. In our lab, we study genomics. That means we combine biology, computational analysis, and clinical questions. And we have one goal. We want to reach better decisions next to the bedside. We wanna help the physicians and the clinicians reach a better decision that can not only extend life, but improve the quality of life. For that, we need to collect significant clinical data, various data. It could be DNA information, it could be electronic medical records. And we have to use computational power in order to analyze it. Our work is based on three revolutions. The first revolution started about 20 years ago. In 2000, the first human DNA was read from beginning to end. One DNA from beginning to end, three times 10 to the nine. Three billion nucleotides were read of one individual. Since then, we have been trying to understand that using computational analysis, such as in bioinformatics. And also, we learned how to understand it and then write it. The best case was in the pandemic we all suffered from in the year 2020. One point mutation in a virus in a faraway country generated this devastating pandemic. However, 
by reading the DNA of the virus, by using computational power to understand the changes, scientists were able to write a DNA or an RNA and inject it to billions of people around the world. And this actually was able to elicit an immune, an immune response that allows us to gradually come back to our so-called normal lives. This is a test case of the three revolutions of reading, understanding, and writing DNA or writing RNA. Let's go back to basics. So a building is built out of bricks and the human being is made out of cells, tiny cells, billions of cells connected to each other. A collective of cells will generate tissues, some tissues together will generate organs, then systems, and the entire body. If we can take one human cell, we'll see that inside there's a tiny part called the nucleus in all our cells. And if we could increase the size or take tweezers and open the cell and open the nucleus, we'll take out a very tiny string from all our cells. This tiny string is the DNA, the genetic makeup of our systems. And if we read it, we'll understand how to generate an entire human being from beginning to end. In fact, this tiny string in every one of our cells is about 1.8 meters, folded and packed inside all our cells. Practically, I am now scattering cells and DNA around me. You are scattering DNA around you. And if we can take that DNA, we could read it from beginning to end. We'll understand the book of life, how to generate an entire human being just like you. And in fact, all living organisms or creatures on planet Earth are made out of cells, and all these cells have the genetic makeup in them. Also, yeast and bacteria and even viruses. Imagine we could predict the future. In fact, we can. We wake up in the morning, we take out the supercomputer that we have in our pockets or on our shelves, and we know whether we should take an umbrella in order not to get wet on our way to work or which route we should take in order to avoid traffic jams. So this is based on the advancements in computer power and storage. And you can see an example here. This is the leap in 60 years, a huge leap in 60 years, which allows us to foresee which road to take or whether we need to take an umbrella. Will we be able to wake up in the future and ask our supercomputer which drug should I take or what should I eat or what sports should I play in order to extend my life or quality of life? Well, probably yes, but this will depend on an additional technology, and that is DNA sequencers or our ability to read the DNA, the genetic makeup. Now here you can see on the left hand side the first generation DNA sequencer or reader. On the right hand side, about 30 years later, this is the second generation DNA sequencer. Now notice the leap here in our ability to read DNA. A huge leap in our ability to read the entire genetic code of human beings. Now let's compare the two technologies. Here we are plotting the leap in our ability to compute or use computers. And if we plot on the same graph our ability to read an entire human DNA, you can see a massive advance in our ability to read DNA, which by far exceeds the computational power. But that actually means that we could read lots of DNA and the computational power allows us also to understand it better. There's still a large gap. Still, the advancements in our ability to read DNA is by far exceeding the computational power, the advance in computational power, but we're combining both of them in order to better understand human diseases. Let's look what happened in the past 200 years. Life expectancy increased in the past 200 years from an average of about 35 to above 80. In the past 200 years, what happened to the population increased for from under 1 billion to close to 8 billion people in the past 200 years. And the basic question is, how can we maintain, not only extend the quality of life, extend life expectancy, but also increase the quality of life? And the answer is quite simple, assimilation and adaptation of new technologies. 
and there's an increase in assimilation of new technologies. The better the technology, the easier it is to use. We've seen throughout the years, the adaptation increases gradually. It's not enough to collect clinical data and to run computational analysis on it. You lose these technologies along the way when you take the data, you translate it into information, and you try to gain knowledge out of it, and then you try to assimilate it in the clinic. And it takes time. What we do today is actually sick care. What we want to reach is health care. Catching or capturing the diseases extremely early when you can change the course of the potential disease. And this is what we do here in our lab at Tel Aviv University. And I'm going to tell you three stories about three experiments we ran in the lab. If we look at our blood and we look at various molecules inside our blood, we can notice that some of our cells release tiny snippets or tiny parts of DNA, mostly from healthy cells. But if we look very carefully and we use a lot of computational data and a lot of analysis of DNA, we'll also notice very few molecules from sick cells or cells that are deteriorating in health. Now, if we combine the two technologies I showed you, we will be able to detect diseases and separate them from, separate healthy from diseased individuals, but maybe we can also detect them ahead of time. In our first study, we wanted to see whether we can separate four types of cancer based on tiny DNA snippets floating in our plasma. And what we did is we built an algorithm that understands what types of DNA molecules are present inside four different types of cancer. After training our system, we took it to new data and we asked the system to separate the four types of cancer based on the knowledge of the training set. And what we saw is that we were able to identify colorectal cancer from tiny pieces of DNA in the blood at early stages at a very high accuracy. We also were able to detect breast cancer, lung cancer, and ovarian cancer. That means that by looking at small DNA molecules inside our blood, we will be able to separate the type of cancer and hopefully eventually also detect it very early for early intervention or changing the course of the disease. In our second study, we looked at stool samples. We took stool samples of colorectal cancer patients and controls. We extracted the DNA from these individuals and we trained our computational system to tell apart the DNA of these sick individuals from the healthy individuals. After training them, we tried a new set. And in the new set, we were able to separate the disease from the healthy individuals even better than conventional methods. You can see the red line here is based on our algorithm. The other conventional methods of identifying the cancer perform less accurately than what we than what we reached. What we did see is that the separation is not only based on the human DNA, but also based on the bacterial DNA, meaning that the microbiome or the bacterial content of colorectal cancer patient changes based on the disease. And if we read the DNA in the stool, we will be able to separate the diseased one from the healthy ones, and maybe we will also be able to do it at a very early stage for early intervention. And in our last and third study, we ran an experiment which is called non-invasive prenatal testing. These tests have been common in the past few years, and currently they run like this. In a pregnant woman at uh, week 10, there are small pieces of DNA running in the blood, and these are mostly the mother's DNA. However, about 10% of the DNA in the mother's blood are small snippets of DNA from the placenta and the embryo. Now, if we use the computational power and we use the power of reading the DNA deep enough, we thought that we will be able to separate it. What we saw here is that conventional methods now use reading the DNA and looking for gross changes at the very high, uh, at the very low magnification. And if they identify a bit more of chromosome 21, the mother is not sick. The conclusion is that it's, it's probably based from a duplication, 
of a chromosome 21, or it could be 13 and 18. But if you think about it, actually looking at chromosomes is a very low resolution. It's like looking at planet Earth from a satellite and trying to figure out if there's an additional continent. What we thought is maybe we could look at a higher resolution and a higher magnification and look at towns and villages and streets and maybe look at specific houses. And if we increase that magnification, we will be able to see not only changes in the entire chromosomes, but also point mutations in the DNA. And this is an example here of how we train the system to tell apart mother's DNA from embryonic DNA. You can see the fragment sizes. In black, you see the fragment sizes of the mother's DNA. In red, you see the fragment sizes of the embryonic DNA. There's an overlap, but there's still a separation here. We added additional features till the separation was clear enough after we had a very clear separation between the mother's DNA and the embryonic DNA from a simple blood test taken at week 10, we, will, we were able to rebuild the entire embryonic DNA from beginning to end. In 2009, we published it, the first embryonic DNA from a simple blood test taken at week 10 of pregnancy. And now we're working very closely with physicians, collecting additional samples in the operation room and uh, at uh, other uh, scenarios so we could identify and detect these small DNA snippets and see how we, we can shift the sick care eventually to health care in these systems. So when we think about big data's role in, future, in the future of medicine, we actually feel like we're trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Huge amounts of data, a lot of computational analysis, and we can't even grasp them all. However, if we set out our algorithms and use and look at, at uh, uh, better samples and increasing our sample size, we, will, we believe we will be able to reach better decisions next to the uh, patient's bed and move and shift our analysis towards healthcare eventually. That will benefit society. These are the wonderful students performing these studies. The top left-hand side, Artyom, did the cancer study. Bottom right-hand side, Tom Arbinovich did the prenatal analysis studies. Thank you. Noam, thank you very much. That was remarkable. I, I have to say, if, when I think in perspective of what you're doing, it's a digital heaven because there's no question that what you're doing is making a really remarkable impact on healthcare and I think is, is really not just the future of medicine, but should be the now of medicine. So thank you very much for that really exciting and very, very easy to follow lecture. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the other side of the spectrum. I told you earlier that um, one of the things that we care very much about is the bridge between humanities and medicine. And so we've invited Dr. Galit Wellner, also a very close colleague of mine, I'm proud to say. And she's a lecturer in the multidisciplinary program in humanities at Tel Aviv University. Galit studies digital technologies and their interrelations with humans. She's an active member of the post phenomenology community, which studies philosophy of technology. And I hope we're gonna hear more about that in the next few minutes. She's published several peer reviewed articles and book chapters. She's written books, she's translated very critical books to Hebrew, and she's currently working on more, dealing with digital imagination and an attention in the digital age. So Galit, thank you for joining us. And it's really nice to see the two of you together in a room. It's nice that we can, while we're delivering this virtually, we can still be together. So thanks Galit, let's hear from you. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, Noam, for the great presentation. Um, in my talk today, I'd like to, um, yeah, I'd like to ask a why question. And the question that bothers me, why do people analyze their DNA? Why do people do this uh, very simple sequencing of a uh, paying, spitting, and just waiting for the results to come? And what's even more, why do they publish the results on social networks? Now, the, there are some answers for such questions. 
And some of them are, uh, were given in the context of uh, what is called quantified self. It's a whole field of people that are self-measuring themselves and are generating huge amounts of data on themselves. Each and every one of us with a smartwatch uh, or a Fitbit produces this kind of data. And again, many people who are using this kind of technology are placing the results are posting them on social networks. Isn't it strange? Some people, especially above a certain age, would, would think this is really, really strange. And I'd like to give some answers that were already given in the context of the quantified stuff, and I believe that we can learn something from that context. So the first explanation is just a matter of curiosity. Just as we sent curiosity to Mars to know what is out there, so the same process goes inside to know what's inside us, what's in there. And it's so interesting, isn't it? The second uh, kind of rationale was about self-improvement. And we really want to improve. You know, we are uh, going to the gym and we are very, and we're so careful about our dieting. Isn't it about caring of ourselves? It's a sign, you know, I care for myself, therefore I do these genetic tests. It's kind of a good sign, yeah, I'm a good person. Not only I'm dieting, I'm also doing these genetic tests. The third explanation is more about the narcissism. And it's about the creation of a kind of a self-image, of a selfie. But it's a selfie that is not made of pixels. It's a selfie that is made of data. And Noam already explained to us what a huge amount of data is being collected in these kind of processes. So with the narcissism, it's very similar act to posting a selfie of myself on a social networking so that everybody sees what I look like this morning. So I put this data selfie so that everybody knows who I am, what I am, and what do I look like information-wise. The fourth explanation is slightly more subversive. And it's about control. And people are saying, why only, let's say, the insurance company would know everything about me? Why only the a credit card company would know about me? I should know about myself. And I can know throughout these amazing tests that are out there. So I have this control of my own data. And the last one is about participation. To be part of this huge and amazing project that Noam described so beautifully of scientific research. And here I'd like to give a, a short story. Uh, and the story goes back to, to 2012 with uh, Professor Michael Snyder from uh, Stanford University. Him and his team, they had this amazing research. They took uh, one person and tracked that person for 14 months, not only for the DNA, each and every aspect, what is called the omics. They were uh, testing blood every day. All this kind of data was collected for 14 months. And when they published it, it was so rich research. But after the publication, it turned out that this person on which the data was collected was no other than Michael Snyder himself. So he was participating in this kind of scientific research. Maybe it was just you know, to make easier all kinds of uh, ethical considerations. I don't know. But it's also possible, maybe it's a matter of control, of narcissism, of self-improvement, or of curiosity. Right? All the other ex explanations would make sense exactly the same way. So what we see with these kind of genetic tests that are available for each and every one of us, at least in the Western world, is a kind of what I call technologies of the self. It's technologies through which I explore myself and I know myself. 
if you know in the romanticism of the 18th and 19th century, people were traveling from Europe to the Middle East as part of the Bildung process to reveal something about themselves. Now you don't have to travel anywhere. You just, as I said, you pay, spit, and send, and that's it, and you get all the data. And there are so many technologies that are involved in this process, and I will talk about it shortly in the next slide. But I would also like to stress that it gives us a new sense of our body. It's not just a body that I see in the mirror. It's a sense of the body that I know maybe that some parts are potentially defective. BRCA1 patients, all of a sudden they feel a bit differently with their own body just because they were diagnosed okay, for a potential breast cancer. And all this leads us to finding ourselves into a predefined categories, categories that we didn't define, but are just out there. And we are classified into them throughout these genetic tests. So all this leads us to, on one hand, a new form of identity that is not just visual, and it's not just a matter of personal processes, but also kind of information that is being read on us and with us. And also it's a new formation process, something that we go through, but with data and with technologies. Sorry. With regards to the quantified self, there's a whole discussion that is known as the panopticon. This notion was first termed by uh, Jeremy Bentham at the end of the 19th century. And it's a structure of a prism. But it's a very special architecture. As you can see here in the, in the diagram, there's a guard in the middle, a single guard. And all around are the inmates. Now, the inmates, they have no idea when they are being looked at. So they have to behave themselves all the time because they don't know when they will be looked at, right? At a certain stage, they internalize the right way to behave, okay? And then they behave properly. So the architecture forces itself on the inmates to behave as the prison would like them to behave. Now, Michel Foucault, in the 60s and 70s, he was reading Jeremy Bentham's book, and he said, in a Discipline and Punish, he said, but we find it everywhere. This is the modern subject. We find it in the factories, that the bosses are looking for a bug at the employees. We find it in schools, we find it in hospitals. It's a structure that is so typical to modernity. This is how the modern subject is being built. It is part of us because we know that we might be looked at, so we behave ourselves. Now, when my students, when they listen to this, they say, mm, I don't think so. You know this? And I tell them, you're right. Because in the age of social networking, what we have is the reverse panopticon. Instead of the guard being in the middle, what is in the middle is us. We put ourselves in the middle, and we want everyone to look at us. So it's not a matter of the visibility that is becoming a threat. On the contrary, we are afraid not of the visibility, but of the invisibility, of not being looked at. And the data that is being generated, the genetic data, is just part of this effort not to be invisible. So in this process of going from the threat of visibility to the threat of invisibility, there are so many technologies that are involved and so many algorithms, again, as Noam uh, showed us, and many more of them, those also of the social networks. But we don't know how these algorithms are operating. We don't know their logic. It is a trade secret of these companies. We don't know how it is produced. But these algorithms, they shape our own identity. 
Do you think this is a good situation? I'm not sure. It should be part of our knowledge of how we are formed. Sorry. So with this notion of reverse panopticon, I'd like to put it in the context of the genetic tests. And originally, it pushes us to self-improve, to self-improve ourselves. We want to be better. We want to be healthier, right? This is the purpose of these uh, tests. We also want to know ourselves more. And the reverse panopticon, with its shift from visibility to invisibility, to the threat of visibility, to the threat of invisibility, it explains why we want to publish the results, because we want to be there at the center, and we don't want to be invisible. We want to be as visible as possible. And it also explains the motivations like the curiosity and the narcissism. It explains it beautifully. But again, and I would like to stress it again, the visibility is determined and managed by opaque algorithms whose logic is concealed from us. We don't know the logic. So with this in mind, I would like to see more visibility of these kind of uh, algorithms. I'd like to be able to understand the risks that are being developed, the risks of being uh, uh, diagnosed in a certain way. What does it mean? To have more data, not just that I'm diagnosed for a possibility of a certain disease. What does it mean? What kind of diet should I be taking with it? All these data should be available once I know that I'm part of this group that I didn't know that I belonged to. And I would like to have new tools to investigate the risks. And I'd like to bring you one risk, one such risk. Noam was speaking of how genetic tests should be closer to the patients. And he's right. They should be closer. But they will be closer also to healthy people. And let's think of an employer who wants to screen potential employees. Maybe that employer, let's say, it's an investment bank. And the investment bank would like to hire people that are stress resistant. Is it possible to get this data via genetic tests? And if he does, what kind of risks are involved in this process? I'd like us to develop this kind of risk assessment and have the proper tools to investigate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Galit. Well, that was fantastic and showed us uh, a different side of the questions and the issues that um, Professor Shamron that Noam was talking about. And um, I wanna say also the contribution that you've made at Tel Aviv University in bridging between medicine and humanities and allowing us to both perform the experiments, accumulate all the data, and then ask these really critical questions has really been wonderful. It, it also fits on, on something that both of you has alluded to that we're starting a new center for the research on aging at Tel Aviv University. And I'm sure that both of you will be involved because the questions that you've posed have long-term ramifications there as well. So the, there's, there's, well, there's a lot of questions. I'm waiting for some to come through the Q&A, but I have some burning questions in the meantime. So Noam, let's, let's turn back to you. Uh, today, if you wanna get a blood test, nobody thinks twice about it. You go to your HMO, to your physician, you order a blood test, you get the lab results. Nobody seems too concerned about who sees those lab results. And there's a lot of information actually there that's, that's being used by the HMOs to make predictions about disease. But as you said, it's a little bit about resolution and we're definitely in a place that we can resolve what's gonna to happen to us, not only now, but in the future, much better through the DNA genomic technologies that you've talked about. So what do you predict? Are we gonna be able to read our DNA one day as easily as we can have a blood test? Yes, we will be able to do that, but it's a very subjective question. Currently, if you want to read your DNA, you usually sit in front of your physician or geneticist or counselor, and uh, 
you ask them uh, whether you can have the DNA tested, the first question they will ask you, what do you want it for? What interests you? What are the questions you want to ask? And that's a totally legitimate question. Because if, uh, for example, you had a few cases of cancer in the family, then you can mention that you're concerned that you might be carrying a gene that might lead to early uh, predisposition to cancer. So specifically, I suggest you can scan for these genes only, but not a really wide scan that would give you a lot of information that maybe you won't know what to do with. For example, if they tell you that you have also predisposition to Alzheimer, you can't really do much about that. Or Parkinson's disease, you can't do much about that. So I think if you really focus your questions to uh, specific categories, it's, uh, it would be fine to read your DNA and sit with your uh, genetic counselor or geneticist or any clinician and really understand what is the reason you're asking for looking at your DNA and looking uh, for a very specific answer. So I think that you raised a point that also uh, Galit raised, um, uh, talked about, and that's whether we're talking about healthy subjects wanting to know what's happening on a genomic level, or we're talking about those that already have a particular disease. They want to know what the genetic diagnosis, what the cause of their disease is. And so there are differences there that I'd like you to address, Galit, but then maybe we can hear from you, Noam, because there's what we call incidental findings. If I go in with a particular disease and I'm told exactly what the genetic reason is for that disease, there's a lot more information now that you're gonna have in all of that big data that you're collecting that can give me a, a, a map of, of, of a lot more of, of what's happening. And so how much should I know about the rest of it if I've only come in for a particular reason? So first let's hear from this kind of a twofold question, Galit, from you and the difference between healthy and, and someone coming in with a disease. Before that, I, I, sorry, I just want to yeah. mention that if you test your DNA, there's implications for your children, their children, you know, your siblings, and also your cousins, because you, you share the same DNA. And right. I want to hear what you think about it. It's not only yeah. you anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's well, all your surrounding. In the scenario that, that you just gave, it was a matter of having a kind of a gatekeeper. And the geneticist functions as a gatekeeper that keeps people uh, from too much information. But we don't always have these, these gatekeepers. Uh, and sometimes these gatekeepers are algorithms. Uh, and today in the, the, the commercial genetic test, there are these algorithms. And the algorithms would say that uh, I can get a, how, what percentage of a Neanderthal a person I have in, in my genetic uh, a code, right? Uh, and I can get uh, diseases one, two, three, four, but there's more data out there and they don't reveal it. Like, I have no idea what, what is out there, okay? Uh, and I think that there should be a work on that and we should make it clear for people what kind of data you get, what kind of data you should get and how you should get it. Maybe it should be through a third party a professional third party, a professional geneticist. Maybe the, there should be a new profession of geneticist, uh, a, a kind of mediator that would make sure that people get the right data at the right time, because this data might influence their whole lives for nothing. But right? they can still claim it's their own data and, and they uh, are allowed to query themselves based on their own DNA. Are you the one to tell them to do it or not? If you want to run an MRI test on yourself, can you just go and run a, you know, pay a center and look and, and you know, get yeah. information, CT images, MRI images, and analyze yourself? So why not DNA? Exactly. And people want to be experts for themselves and they don't want to be dependent on external experts. But if we offer a kind of a service that would allow people to get more data and get it in the right way, I think it, it should be a win-win proposition. And it shouldn't be, no, 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 we should block the data from you. No, on the contrary, we want to make it more uh, applicable to you and provide you with additional information, let's say about the potential dieting, just because you have this potential for certain disease. Okay, so direct-to-consumer uh, DNA tests are not available in Israel 
by mail, but they are in the US. And there are companies offering it also on Amazon to test your exactly. own DNA. And even in Israel, I have some uh, friends and colleagues who have done this. You know, the post is working yeah, and you just send it. I know some it. tricks you can do. Yeah, right, yeah, to, they just do that. Yeah. DNA. We're going to learn some tricks here today. That's great. <laughs> okay, so, so we, do, we do have a question um, from our, our audience. And it, I think it's something critical to talk about because it really is in the realm of genomics. And that's CRISPR. We didn't talk too much about it today. That probably can be a subject of an entire webinar on its own, I'm sure. Uh, it's happening on the level of cells and the, on the level of models, just, just starting in humans. What do you think is going to happen on a larger scale in the coming years? And is that something that you're exploring in, in your side of research, Galit? Well, CRISPR is a, is a game changer, of course. Uh, and it's a matter of uh, controlling our own future, of shaping our body. Um, and it reminds me, you know, the, the discussion that was available uh, at the beginning of the 20th century with regards to uh, uh, psychoanalysis. And funnily, you know, in psychoanalysis, they, the psychoanalyst collects so much data, stupid data sometimes, you know, the way we pronounce a certain word, okay? It's not just about the words. And with all this kind of information, the psychoanalysis, the psychoanalysis enables one to understand the person that is there. And with CRISPR, it's kind of an automation of these processes. Uh, we see that also uh, with uh, the new ways of uh, uh, having um, psychological treatments online. This is the kind of a direction that I see, go, it goes hand in hand. The CRISPR on the, let's say on the bodily level uh, and the psychological uh, treatments, automatic uh, treatments. And they are both aiming at trying to improve ourselves and create a better self of, of us. Uh, plastic surgery is again, in the same direction, but I would like to pose a question mark. Is it really better? I don't know. I think CRISPR is a natural uh, a process that would come right after reading the DNA, understanding it. If we understand it good enough, we can now fix it. So I think certainly for diseases, we'll be seeing it much more in the uh, near future. Fixing is great, but what about people who just want to improve? You know, I have this, uh, I don't know, here and there, and I just want to improve a bit. What about this? I don't like the color of my hair. Let's do CRISPR and I'd like to be blonde. Why not? There might be easier ways. Um, so you already alluded to this earlier, Noam, but we have a question um, here that wouldn't it be worrying that you knew you had an illness or a disease or that you might get it because of the genetic diagnosis, um, but there's nothing that you can really do about it. So do you think, so, you know, this is a little bit about a personal uh, position on this and then also a professional one. Um, how do we come to terms with, with that? So when you run along the DNA from beginning to end and you look at mutations, usually you divide them into three boxes. The first one are mutations that might be causing a current disease. And that's the first bag. These are critical uh, DNA sequences and you really have to understand them and know them if there's a severe clinical uh, feature that you're suffering from. The second one would be mutations that might cause a disease and there's an actionable uh, feature or actionable uh, um, um, uh, treatment or, or, or action you can uh, take by, which for example, if you know you're going to suffer from a specific type of cancer, you can undergo screening tests uh, more frequently. That means you're at a high risk and you can go more frequently to test and eventually non-actionable ones, mutations that cause a disease that there's nothing to do about. Now, you should decide before you go reading your DNA, which ones are you interested in and you know where to draw the line. The other thing is if you do it with a professional clinician, clinical team, they can help you decide where to draw the line and what you're interested in uh, looking at or understanding. Specific examples, as you mentioned before, the BRCA genes, which predisposes women to cancer at an early age. Do you want to know or maybe you don't want to know? Most women in Israel should know 
because that means that you're put in another group of high risk. High risk, that means it might cause some anxiety, but also that means that you would go more frequently to identify the cancer very early in development if it would develop. And we all know that if you identify cancer at an early, at an early stage, that's a critical point in overtaking or overcoming the disease. The advantage also is you can have peace of mind if you end up coming out negative, if there's a family history of that genetic mutation. Yes. Well, I really liked your example of Mike Snyder, Galit, because he's a friend of mine, know him well, and in fact, he's planning on visiting us in May. So when you meet him, you'll be able to decide what actually drove him to do what he did. Craig Vettner also, it was uh, his That's genome right. that was sequenced by Solera back in the day of the Human yes. Genome Project. And, and there are many who, who predict that one day it won't be a simple blood test and it won't even be just reading your DNA, but we will have a full omics panel done uh, that'll be part of the precision medicine that we're all aspiring to, to help improve our health. So it may seem now extremely expensive and very ambitious, but I predict that it will become part of mainstream care. I can't tell you when, but I do believe it's moving in that direction. But one of the issues that you both raise is what does this mean about privacy? So I'm always intrigued about the people who go on talk shows and they kind of spill their guts and they're willing to talk about everything. And then there's those who don't even want to have a Facebook account because don't want anyone to know anything about them other than their very small circle. And obviously we have a lot in between. But what is having all of this data out there about oneself on the internet, in databases, insurance companies, banks, your employer, um, your friends, your colleagues, your relatives, what does that do in terms of privacy? Okay, um, I think that today's privacy legislation uh, is concentrating on the data itself. And because as Noam showed, on top of the data, we turn it into information and then we turn it into knowledge and, and only then we can make something uh, useful out of it. And I think that the future legislation should make sure that these uh, understandings are being available, first of all, for the holder of the data. I think that's the basics and today it's not done. Like today, uh, if let's say if, if I want to get all my data from Facebook, I get like 800 pages of rubbish, okay? It's like getting uh, just the, the, the genome, the, uh, the letters themselves, which is nothing. I want to understand what they think about me. The same with the genome. I want to understand what it, what's in there. And I want to have this kind of control of this data. To which party do I share it with? I can share it with everyone, of course, but I can decide that I share it only with my employ employer or only with my uh, medical insurance company, but it's up to me. Or maybe I should share it with my family members, but I have, but I have to make this kind of decision. And today we don't have the, the tools for that. Uh, so it's not so much a question of privacy, but it's a matter of how I look at my data and who can also look at it and from which angle. You wanna to add to something? You wanna add something, Noam? I agree that we have a huge amount of information and probably not enough tools or professional teams that can help us digest it and make the right decisions for ourselves and also for our children, again, siblings, cousins. If we share the same DNA, I'm not only exposing myself, I'm exposing all my relatives. Exactly, yeah, I fully agree with you, yeah. So this really brings me to where I wanted to wrap up and that is education. And right here we are at Tel Aviv University and we're, we have a huge focus on research and education and training that next generation. We saw the pictures of your big team, Noam, who's studying all of these different aspects of genomics. We have so many different programs at the university. We have a master's in genetic counseling so that there are genetic counselors who are gonna be providing all of this big data. Um, we, we have School of Con Continuing Medical Education and the Faculty of Medicine so that health professionals and physicians 
we'll learn enough about genetics and genomics because this is this is going to be part of kind of the mainstream medicine uh, in the coming years. And so is whereas you know a while back you didn't really need to know that much genetics. Now most people that you meet on the street have actually heard of CRISPR, and so many of them could probably describe what it is. And as we move into a world where much of this becomes very commonplace, we do have a responsibility to ensure that not only are the health professionals, the scientists, the students educated about these new tools and how to deal with all of this data, but also the public. And so as much as we can teach people about these different aspects, um, not that we can all be bioinformaticians and computational biologists, it's so complicated. The research that we do in our lab, we work with, with Noam to be able to dissect some of them. It's really intricate, but it's exciting because I think that it gives us an opportunity to provide treatments and cures for the future um, for many different aspects, whether we're talking about some of the diseases that Noam mentioned before, whether we're talking about aging. I think it also gives us the opportunity for a much better sense of well being. So on that note, I wanna thank both of you. It was wonderful to spend time with you again. I look forward to continuing to organize as much as we can to bridge that gap between humanities and medicine and uh, hope to see all of you one time again and have a wonderful day or evening, depending on what part of the world you're watching us. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.